Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toy Man and Sean. Today, we're gonna to show you how to install an aftermarket coolant temperature gauge on your first generation Toyota 4Runner. If you're familiar with our channel, you know I've tried to figure out what's going on with my OEM temperature gauge. The first thing I did was replace the coolant temperature sensor that plugs into the intake manifold, and that didn't fix the issue. Then with some additional research, I found that there's a problem that can happen with the gauge. There's some small copper wires on the backside of the gauge that can become disconnected, and then it takes some very fine soldering to fix it. I did try to pull that gauge out once, but I wasn't 100% sure how to get it out without damaging it, so I kind of gave up on that idea. Plus, I do know that these analog gauges aren't a very good way to monitor your coolant temp or transmission temp if you have an automatic transmission because by the time the needle starts to rise on that analog needle gauge it's pretty much too late you've already overheated your engine they don't react quick enough for you to catch a potential problem like you have a leak in your hose or maybe you're just pushing your rig too hard or your thermostat's not opening like it should whatever the situation you'll catch the problem too late and you could potentially do damage to your engine like cracking a head or blowing a head gasket. So I did some research on the subject of how to install one of these gauges. I couldn't find that much information on it, but I'll show you all the parts that I chose to buy for this job to make this happen. There's different ways to do it. This is gonna be my way. Here's the parts for the job with a couple things missing. I don't have the wiring bundles that I have on order with Amazon. They'll come in today. And I also bought a pod that will hold the gauge and I plan on welding on a piece onto my roll bar to where I can mount the pod to. So I'll show you the pod and the wiring bundles I bought via Amazon later on in the video. The gauge I decided to buy comes from Glowshift. It got good reviews on Amazon, so that's what I went with. And this is the gauge pod with this piece attached to it that helps glare, not mess up the reading of the gauge. Along with the gauge comes with the wiring harness that plugs into the back of the gauge and it has the instruction manual showing you how to properly connect all the wires involved. It comes with a bracket and a little package of hardware so you can use this bracket to mount it, but I'm choosing not to use this. And then it comes with some connectors. You'll see that I already connected one of the connectors to the green wire from the harness because I wanted to see if I had the proper crimping tool for this style of connector. I wasn't sure if I had the right one, but I confirmed I have the right type of crimping tool for this. And then I bought this from LC Engineering. It's a water temperature manifold. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut into the upper radiator hose and I'm gonna cut a section out to where I could fit this in, and then I'm just gonna use some regular screw down clamps to affix it to the upper radiator hose. This piece right here is the sending unit that also comes with the glow shift kit, and this is an eighth inch thread, and the threads on this manifold from LC Engineering is three eighths. So I bought this three eighths to eighth inch bushing so I can install the temperature sensor into this manifold and I wrapped it with some Teflon tape on both connections and then just tighten them up with a crescent wrench. And what this is, it's a connection to where you can ground this manifold. The instructions on LC Engineering says this needs to be grounded to be properly installed. So I plan on grounding this right to the head of the engine. So that's pretty much it. Let's get out to the truck and get started with this job. The first thing I wanna do is drain the coolant from the radiator because I will be removing the upper radiator hose and cutting it in half. So I've got a 3 8 inch piece of transmission hose connected to the end of the nipple so I can direct the coolant down into my catch container. The coolant I currently have in the cooling system is pretty new, so it would be wasteful for me to just throw it away and replace it. So I cleaned out this catch basin really well and I'm gonna pour this back into the system when I get done. So I just have to go counterclockwise with this and open it up. 
And because I have this hose on here, I have to like twist the hose with it. You could see some coolant draining in there, but what I'm gonna do is take the radiator cap off to create some venting and then it should flow faster. So the radiator cap is off. It's flowing a lot faster now. So I'm gonna let this drain before I attempt to remove the radiator hose and cut it. While the coolant is draining from the radiator, I'm gonna disconnect this air hose that goes from the throttle body over to the air filter connection. These OEM clamps are a 10 millimeter size. You could also use a Phillips or JIS screwdriver to loosen them. I'm gonna loosen them with my Milwaukee M12 ratchet, short extension, 10 millimeter socket. Both clamps are loose. I should be able to wiggle it off the throttle body here. And then I'll pull it off the air box. And the uh, air tube is now disconnected. I cleaned off the hose with a little bit of cleaner and a paper towel so I can get some good marks with my paint pen to mark where I want to put the manifold into the upper radiator hose. This radiator hose is fairly curved. There's not a whole lot of straight section to it. It's an S curve, but right here in the middle of the S, I think is my best opportunity to get a good connection. So I'm thinking right about there. So I'm gonna mark both sides of the manifold where I need to cut. So that looks pretty good to me. I'm gonna remove the upper radiator hose from the radiator in the engine. I believe these clamps are an eight millimeter. Let me double check that. Yep, they're eight millimeter. This hose hasn't been on there for too long, so I didn't have to use some hose pick tools to get in between the hose and the fittings to break them free. You saw I was able to break it free from here pretty easily. The radiator side was a little bit more stuck, but a little bit of twisting was all was necessary to get it free. I bought a couple hose clamps from O'Reilly's. They go from three quarter to an inch and three quarter. I'm pretty confident this is the right size for this job. So I'm gonna clamp these two screw down clamps on the inside of the marks. This will allow me to run my cutting blade right along the edge of the clamp and hopefully get a pretty straight cut. Okay, both those clamps are locked onto the hose pretty well. The gap all the way around looks pretty symmetrical. So I think this is gonna work to get me a pretty straight cut. All right, I've got my utility blade. I've got a fairly fresh blade on there that's sharp and I'm gonna start cutting. The one area that is maybe troublesome is right along where the screw of the clamp goes. It's not exactly in line with the band. Okay. That's one side, I gotta do the other side. And there it is, I've got the section I needed to cut out to make room for the manifold. I did go back and mark which side connects up to the radiator. I have a feeling that it was connected backwards when we last worked on the engine because the hose was coming in contact pretty hard with the air tube and I played around with the two different orientations and I found that having this side connected to the radiator put the radiator hose further away from the air tube. So I pretty much believe that I had it on backwards from the last time I worked on it. So I'm gonna install the manifold. I'm first gonna put on the two band clamps. I gotta take them off this section first. And the question is, which way is it gonna be better? I think I'm gonna put the clamps on the bottom because the air tube comes kind of close. Okay, I've got it in there. I'm not 100% sure where it's gonna be best. So I'm not gonna tighten these clamps all the way, but I'm gonna tighten them up a little bit. I played around with the angle of the manifold in relation to the air tube and I think I've got it where I want it. What I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be putting some split wire loom to protect the wires, and then I'm gonna run it along the air tube towards the driver's side 
firewall to run the wires through, at least from this spot right here. There's going to be other wires that I need to run through the engine at different spots. I think that's going to work. I'm going to take the air tube out of the way and I'm going to lock down the clamps and then start filling the radiator. For the final tightening of the hose clamps, I like using my little short 3 8 ratchet and cinch them down. You could just do it with a flat blade screwdriver or if it's a Phillips, you can do it that way. But I like to just use my little short ratchet and kind of choke up on it and get them nice and snug. And all those feel good. So now I could start filling the coolant. I have my Lizzle spill-free funnel in place. But after thinking about it, I think I want to get the air tube back in because I'm going to want to start the engine to burp the system. And I'm going to need the air tube in place to start it. So I'm going to get that in next. I'm going to connect it up to the throttle body side first. Okay, I've got it connected to both sides and now I just got to retighten the clamps. I was going to tighten down the air tube, but then I realized something. The ground strap connection to the manifold is going to be hard to attach with the air tube in the way. So I've got to get the air tube out of the way, create the ground strap from the manifold to the engine hanger, and then I'll put the air tube in because I'll show you how tight it is. You can see how tightly the top of the manifold comes to the air tube and I won't be able to make that ground strap connection to the top of the manifold with the air tube in the way. So I'll get that out of the way, create the ground strap, and I plan on connecting it right to that top bolt for this engine lift point. All right, I'm gonna make the ground strap. I've got some 16 gauge wire. I'm gonna use these cool strippers from Klein, pretty handy. And then I'm gonna pick the size connector that will fit the little Allen screw that connects the wire to the manifold and the 10 millimeter bolt that will be grounding it to the engine lift point at the front of the engine. So the size I need are these little blue ones. Man, I only got one left of this size. That's the perfect one. Okay, at least I had one left. And then this one will have to be that size. Okay, so I'll twist the wire a little bit. I'll slide it into the connector. These are a shrink type of connector. And I have these ratcheting crimpers. These are actually jaws for a shrink butt connector rather than a terminal connector. But let's see how well it works. Seems like I got a pretty good crimp. I'm pulling on it pretty good. That worked out. And then I have to go over to the engine and figure out how long I need to make this. I marked it with a paint pen where I need to cut it. I'll strip it. And I'll crimp it. Okay, both those connections are tight. I'm gonna get my heat gun out and I'm gonna shrink these. Okay, I've got this little short ground strap made. And now I'm gonna connect it. The spot on the engine lift point that I'm gonna connect the ground strap to has got some pretty good paint on it. So I'm gonna take my die grinder with a little sanding disc and just sand off the paint. Okay, I've got a nice clean section of clean metal and now I'm gonna connect up the ground strap. The size of this Allen wrench is a eighth inch. Okay, that's nice and tight. I'm just gonna bend this down a little bit to get it closer to the manifold. And then I just gotta get a 10 millimeter on this and cinch that up. Okay, the ground strap is in place. Now I can get the air tube back in. Okay, the air tube's back in place. Now I just got to tighten the clamps. And I'll do the final tightening with my short ratchet. Okay, the air tube is back in place. Now I'm gonna start filling the radiator. Before you start filling, just do a sanity check that you got everything tight. And I know I've got the upper radiator hose with the manifold properly tightened 
and I tightened the petcock valve, also known as the drain valve, at the bottom of the radiator because it would be pretty silly to start pouring in coolant that's just going out the bottom, but I guarantee you people have done it. So just do a last minute check and make sure you did that. Sometimes I put the top on because as it's going down, it kind of glugs up and it spills over the side. It stopped draining into the radiator, so now what I need to do is start the engine, and I'm probably gonna roll it back in my driveway a little bit to get it at more of a slope. You want the radiator the highest point so it facilitates the burping of the system. If I pull it out into my driveway and back it out of the entrance of the garage, I'll be at more of a slant and achieve a better burping of the system. I'm gonna go inside the cab and I'm gonna turn the heater control valve all the way hot so the coolant will flow through the heater core and all the heater hoses. This first gen 4Runner also has a rear heater so I also turned up the temperature control all the way hot in the back too. So all the way hot for the front, all the way hot for the back so the coolant flows all the way through the system. I'm just waiting for the engine to get hot, for the thermostat to open so the coolant will start circulating through the whole system. I ran the engine for a while. I was revving it via the throttle body. More bubbles were coming out, but it's gotten to the point where even revving the engine, no more air is really working its way out of the system. So I'm now gonna disconnect the funnel. The way you make it spill free is you squeeze the upper radiator hose to push a little bit of the coolant out into the funnel and then when you pull the funnel off, you won't get a leak. And then I'm just gonna transfer this over to the reservoir over here. So I'm gonna squeeze the upper radiator hose. You'll probably see some bubbles come up. And then I'm gonna put the plunger in. I'll take the reservoir cap off and then I'll twist this off and I'm gonna transfer it over to here. So that's as far as I'm gonna to get today. The wires and the pod mount is supposed to arrive today from Amazon, so hopefully that's the case, and I'll be able to finish filming this job tomorrow. All right, I'm back on the next day, and I'm gonna start covering the wiring portion of this install. The instructions that come with the glow shift gauge are pretty straightforward. You have this wiring harness that attaches to the gauge, and the yellow wire is supposed to go to a 12 volt constant source so it always has 12 volt power even if the ignition key is off the red wire needs to be connected to a 12 volt switch source which means it doesn't have power until you turn the ignition key to the accessory or on position the orange wire needs to be connected to a 12 volt headlight switch source so basically when you turn on the headlights this receives power and then the black wire in this harness is supposed to be connected to a ground and then finally the green wire on this harness connects up to the white wire on the temperature gauge sensor that I installed into that manifold that I spliced into the upper radiator hose. The black wire on that temperature gauge sensor needs to go to a ground and I plan on connecting that ground wire on the sensor to the same grounding spot I did for the manifold. I'm gonna connect it up to that 10 millimeter bolt on the engine lift bracket. I bought this handy set of 20 gauge wire from a Amazon seller. I'll put a link in the video description for this. The only color I don't have is orange, but it's not a big deal. I think I'll probably just gonna connect up the orange wire to the blue wire when I run the wires from the engine compartment through the firewall. The thing that I view as the most difficult part of this install is figuring out where you're gonna tap in to all of these power sources. 12 volt constant, 12 volt switched, 12 volt headlight switched, 
and the ground really isn't a problem. You can find a ground anywhere. But those three other sources, you have to figure out how you're gonna do it. When I installed that aftermarket transmission temperature gauge in my 98 Forerunner, where I tapped into all these sources was the stereo wiring, and it was very convenient because all of those three power sources were readily available for the stereo wiring. With this first gen Forerunner, I'm not as well versed on how to take apart the dash to access those wires. And I was thinking about trying to access the power to the clock because I know that has an illumination 12 volt wire. And I'm pretty certain that I would have a switch source and a constant source for that clock. But I couldn't exactly figure out how to access the back of the clock to get to the wiring. And I decided to just abandon that idea and get all of the power sources from the engine compartment. So now let's go to the engine compartment and I'll show you how I'm gonna tap into all these sources. On this first gen Forerunner that I bought, the previous owner installed an accessory fuse block and this fuse block has constant power from the battery. So I can get 12 volt constant from the fuse block and I could also use the grounding point on this fuse block as my ground. Another simple option is just running the wires directly to the battery. So you got your positive and negative and you can find your ground and 12 volt constant straight from the battery. Another potential constant source that I found by using a test light is the 10 amp fuse that gives power to the hazard lights and the horn. So I'll pull the fuse box cover off and I'll show you the fuse I'm talking about. It's this 10 amp fuse right here. And I'll get my test light out and I'll show you a little later how you can determine what has 12 volt constant power. For the 12 volt headlight switch source, I'm gonna go straight to the wiring for the headlight. So if I drop down in here, the wires running to the plug, a couple of them I could use to tap into and get that 12 volt headlight switch source. And then finally, on this diagnostic port that plugs in to the inside of the driver's side fender, I found that this black wire is a 12 volt switch source. When the key is off, it doesn't have power. As soon as I turn it on, this black wire has power. So I plan on tapping into that for my 12 volt switch source. And then again, going back to the sensor here that I installed in the manifold, the white wire is gonna be connected to the green wire on that harness that goes to the gauge. And then this black wire, I'm just gonna to ground to the same ground spot that I grounded the manifold to. Using a test light, I'll show you how I determine the 12 volt constant and 12 volt switch source. So I'll hook up the test light to a ground, which will be directly to the battery. And then at the top of the fuses, there's a little bit of metal exposed. And if you touch that with the tip of your test light, you'll be able to determine if any of these fuses has 12 volt power. So I'll start on the 10 amp one at the top here. I'll go to the 75 amp one, no power. Go to this other 10 amp, no power. But as soon as I go to this one, you're gonna see the test light light up. And so that means that this circuit has 12 volt constant power. The key is off, the key is not even in the ignition, and this has power currently. So for your 12 volt constant, you could put a tap of fuse in here and connect up another 10 amp fuse to split it to a double circuit, and then you could run your constant power off of this circuit. But like I said, I'm just gonna use that accessory fuse block for my 12 volt power. For the 12 volt switched, I'll show you with my test light, none of the circuits have power currently. So this is the black wire right here that I'm gonna tap into, no light on. I'll check this circuit and I'll check that circuit, nothing. But now I'll go into the cab, I'll put the key in the ignition, I'll turn it to the on position and you will then see that this black wire that runs to this connector is gonna have power. All right, the key is in the ignition. I'm gonna connect the test light to that connector that goes to the black wire. And you can see now that the light is turning on. So this is a 12 volt switch source, this black wire. All right, I have my wiring plan in place. 
Before I start cutting into wires and splicing things, I want to disconnect power. With my rig, I have aftermarket connectors and they are a 13 millimeter. Usually OEM connectors are a 10 millimeter nut. All right, power has been shut off to the vehicle and now I can safely start cutting and splicing wires. The first wire I'm gonna deal with is the ground wire from the sensor to the vehicle ground at the engine lift point. These little special connectors are included with the kit and I already stripped some wire off using my wire strippers. This is a 14 gauge wire that I'm using for this. I wanna capture a little bit of the sheathing and capture the copper strands in this part of the connector. These are the special crimpers that I bought for this type of connector. It has the size right here. This spot right here is for 14 gauge. I'm gonna use some needle nose pliers to get the process started because it's a little hard to have the connector inside the crimping tool and then make sure that I'm capturing the copper wire where I want to. I'm just gonna get it started with a pair of needle nose pliers. Okay, I've got it crimped lightly with the needle nose pliers. Hopefully it's not gonna shift on me when I get the crimper tool on there. Okay, I've got it in the crimper tool. I'm gonna squeeze it down and hopefully make a good connection. And you can see what the finished product looks like. I captured some of the plastic sheathing there and the copper strands are captured right there. I made the ground wire. I just crimped on another ring connector on this end and it's a shrink type where the plastic shrinks around the sheathing of the wire and there's some glue in there. It makes it a, a nice connection. And then on this side, you have to slide on this little plastic piece as an insulator on first. So before I crimp this on, I slid that piece up the wire and slid it onto the back side of this connector that's gonna connect up to the ground wire on the sensor. This plastic piece and the other one connect up to each other and make a weather seal. So now I'll bring this over to the truck and install it. Okay, I plug the ground wire into the black sensor wire. And then again, like I said, I grounded it to the same bolt on this lift bracket. And it looks like I could have made it a little shorter, but I plan on attaching the wires to this air tube right here. So when I do that, it doesn't appear to be too long. So I think I made it right about the correct length. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the necessary wires through the firewall, through a grommet on the driver's side for the other wires. The grommet hole in the firewall I plan on using is in this driver side corner. Right to the right of the clutch master cylinder, there's an area here where the uh, hood latch goes through and some other accessory wiring was pushed through there. When I had a company install an alarm on this thing, they use this route for the wires too. So that's my intended route. I'm gonna try to push the wires through there. I bundled up the wires. I wrapped them with some electrical tape to help keep them together while I'm pushing through the firewall and let's see how it goes. The end of the wires were poking through just enough so I can grab onto it with the needle nose pliers and I pull them through the firewall. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna splice these wires to the harness wires. And remember, everything's gonna be color coordinated with the exception of the orange wire on this harness. The orange wire is gonna go to the blue wire. So you don't need to see this. I'm gonna be stripping wires, crimping shrink buck connectors and shrinking them with my heat gun. And I'll come back when I'm all done. Okay, I've got all the connections made with the shrink buck connectors. Before I go into the engine compartment to do the splicing that I need to do, I wanted to set the length that I think I'll need. Originally, I was gonna put the gauge here, but the gauge that I ordered isn't gonna be coming in for a few days. I thought it was gonna be coming in in a couple, but it's more like a week. So I ordered another one that has a sticker application where I can stick it right here. So for the time being, I'm gonna put a gauge right on top of the steering column plastic shroud and hopefully it's not gonna to interfere too bad with me reading my tachometer and my speedometer. So I'm making it extra long so it can potentially go up to a roll bar mount right here. 
So I'm making sure I give myself enough wire room to be able to choose either mounting point for the gauge. And then you'll see that I put some split wire loom around the wires just to make the install a little cleaner so there's not just all these colored wires exposed. So now I'm gonna start running the wires and splicing them into all the places that I explained earlier. I made the splice of the red wire from the gauge harness into the black wire of this diagnostic port. And this is how you do it. You take a butt connector, or you could solder if you want. On one side of the butt connector, you put the uh, original wire and the wire you're splicing into this circuit together on one side. So you can see that the red wire and the black wire going to the diagnostic port are connected on one side of the butt connector. And then on the other side of the butt connector, you complete the circuit by connecting the black wire on this side. So this is an example of how you tap into the circuits for the power that you require. This air box is gonna get in the way of me getting down here comfortably to splice into the headlight wire for the 12 volt headlight source. So I'm gonna remove the air box. There's a 12 millimeter bolt down there near the coolant reservoir. There's another one down there near the driver's side fender. And then there's a third 12 millimeter bolt towards the engine that I have to remove. And then of course I need to disconnect the air tube and whether or not I need to disconnect the mass airflow sensor, I'll figure that out. I might just be able to shift it out of the way enough and not disconnect this. I've got the air box out of the way. Again, disconnected the air tube. There's a air intake right here that pulls air into the air box from the front of the vehicle. And then back down in here, there was a harness clip that I just cut so I can pull the wires out further. And then right now I'm taking some of the sheathing off so I have more room to work to cut and splice wires. I made the splice into the headlight wiring. For this plug, this side and this side get power when you turn on the headlight. This one in the center is a ground. So I tapped into the wire that's red with a white stripe, but you could also tap into the red wire with a yellow stripe. This red and green one must be a ground, so don't connect into that one. Now that I finished the headlight connection, I worked on the green wire that goes to the white wire on the sensor. And I'm protecting it with a little bit of split wire loom right there going to the sensor. If I didn't first already test out my pliers on this connection, I could have just made one continuous connection, but I had to uh, butt splice it here to connect up to the green wire going to the gauge. And again, I have some split wire loom that I'm gonna put that wire in, and then I'm just gonna continue to zip tie it along the air tube. Okay, I have the green wire going over to the white connector on the sensor, routed nicely along the air tube. The only issue would be if I ever have to remove the air tube, I'll have to cut all these zip ties to remove the air tube, but that's the price I'm gonna have to pay to route it cleanly right across here. So now what I have to do is I have to run the yellow wire and the black wire over to the accessory fuse block on the inside of the passenger fender. The yellow is 12 volt constant and the black will be ground. Okay, I have the 12 volt constant and ground wire ran across the firewall. So it just goes along the firewall and then it connects into the fuse block. I've got the ground connected there and then I've got the positive connected back there. So now I can put the cover back on this and then I'll go into the cab and I'll mount the gauge with the adhesive that it comes with on top of the steering column plastic trim. Here's the pod and I already installed the gauge in there. It has this double-sided adhesive. So I'm gonna peel off one side, stick it on, and then I'm gonna install it on top of the steering column trim. This pod comes with this rubber grommet that you stick over the gauge so it fits tightly inside here. So I already have that installed. So here's the mounting location. It's gonna block the red line area of the tachometer, but I normally don't red line this thing, so it's not a big issue to me. I could still read most of the speedometer, so this location might work. But like I said, I have a metal one that I have on order that will be here in a few days, and I could weld on a little tab here 
and mount it here. That was my original plan. But for now, I'm gonna cross my fingers, hook up the battery, start this thing, and hope my wiring job was good. Okay, here we go. I figured out my mistake. I stupidly forgot to reconnect the mass airflow sensor. So now I'll start it again. Let's see if this thing dims when I turn the headlights on. Sweet, it does. Perfect. So where I have it connected in the upper radiator hose, I'm not gonna register an accurate temperature until the thermostat opens up. So that's one downside of the way I installed it because I'm not gonna see the progression of temperature, but that's okay. I'm really not worried about the lower temperatures. I'm worried about the higher temperatures so I can notice when I'm overheating the engine. Like maybe a problem happens where a, a coolant hose bursts or I'm just pushing it really hard and hot temps and I see the temperature start to spike on the gauge, it will let me know when it's prudent to pull off and let the engine cool or to assess what's going on because I might have a coolant leak. You can see the problem I have with this OEM gauge. The freaking thing is already at operating temperature, so that's what it does. Sometimes it gradually climbs, other times as soon as I start it up, it climbs all the way to operating temp. So I'm gonna let this thing run for a while and see if the gauge starts reacting. Well, I would have thought the thermostat would have opened by now. It's not looking good, but let's see what happens as I wait a little longer. Okay, it's working. I figured out the problem. The engine lift point was painted on the backside and it also wasn't getting a very square connection to the head. So I shaved down one edge of the lift bracket so it would fit flush with the head. And then I took the paint off the backside, reconnected it, and now this temperature gauge is working. Thank God. It looks like the thermostat just opened because the gauge is now climbing. So the temperature I was reading was the coolant that was sitting in the upper radiator hose. So now it's climbing up towards 180. That's kind of interesting. Turning on the lights affects the gauge. It goes up a little bit. Not a whole lot, but it climbs just a little bit. I don't know what to make of that. It fluctuates about five degrees when I turn the lights on. It's interesting, even when I turn something else on like the AC, there's an additional power draw and the temperature gauge goes up. I'll turn the AC on, you'll see. Same thing, it goes up like about five degrees. I changed the color on this. You can push this button and cycle through colors. That's a decent one. That one's not bad either. I'm gonna stick with this green one for now. You can see that the temperature's right about 184. So I'm gonna use a infrared thermometer. I'm gonna point it at the top of the radiator and see if the temperature I'm reading with the infrared thermometer corresponds with the gauge. So right now it's in between like 180 and 184. So I'll point the infrared thermometer at the top of the radiator and it's reading about 176. Pretty close to what the gauge was reading. Well, I figured out the problem with the fluctuation of the temperature gauge when I create a power draw. It was the ground. So the ground location on that engine lift point that connects to the head, that ground isn't the greatest. It was a problem at the beginning, but once I cleaned off the metal and got a better connection with the head, it seemed sufficient, but it wasn't ideal. So let me show you now that the problem is fixed. I'll turn on the headlights, but I'll have the camera focus at the gauge. I turned it on and there's no fluctuation in the needle. I'll also turn on the AC and see if there's any difference. The needle's pretty steady. So I think I solved the problem. So I moved the ground strap connection for the sensor from this area over to the inside of the driver's side fender. I'm connecting it to the body. And I just brought the ground wire along the air tube and the split wire loom over to the driver's side fender. What helped me diagnose the problem 
was just a wire with a couple alligator clips. I clipped one side to the sensor ground and then I brought it over to the negative terminal on the battery and I found that the needle was stable under a power draw. Once I learned that, I knew it was a grounding problem and then I connected the alligator clip to that bolt on the driver's side fender and realized that was a good ground. The needle was staying stable under a power draw. And so that's how I figured out the issue. And now my temperature gauge is working like it should, which makes me very happy. In regards to where you install your temperature sensor for your glow shift gauge, when I was doing my research, some people talk about utilizing the OEM temperature sensor location. You remove the OEM sensor and put your sensor there. I didn't want to mess with that option because I replaced that sensor back in the past and it has a unique shape to it. And I'm thinking that there's a chance that I'm going to get a leak at that point using an aftermarket sensor or a bushing that's going to adapt to the size of the temperature sending unit for the glow shift gauge. Another possible location is the water neck connection right here. Since I have air conditioning on this rig, that sensor is a safety mechanism. If your vehicle starts to overheat, it will shut off the air conditioning. At least that's what I understand that sensor is for. So for people that don't have air conditioning, they could try to buy this used from somebody and then plug in their sensor right there. That's what my buddy Jordan did. I could have eliminated that protective sensor, but I chose not to. I didn't want to mess with that. And so that's why I decided to place my sensor in the upper radiator hose via an aluminum manifold that I bought from LC Engineering. One possible problem with the way I installed the temperature sensor into the upper radiator hose is what if the thermostat sticks. If the thermostat does stick, I'm not gonna catch it immediately, but I will catch it fairly soon. From a cold start, if I start driving it and I don't see the needle on the aftermarket gauge start to rise, I'm gonna know something is up and I'm gonna stop and investigate. It could be a problem with the gauge itself, the wiring, or the thermostat stuck, but I could simply put my hand on the radiator and if that thing feels cold and I've been running the engine for a while, that means that the thermostat is sticking and I need to do some investigating so I don't burn up my engine. Now, the thermostat could fail after the engine is warmed up. I go somewhere, I stop for a while, the engine is still warm, the coolant in the upper radiator hose is still warm, so I'm still gonna be registering a temperature. But again, after I drive it for a while, if the temperature doesn't fairly quickly get up to operating temp, which I've learned is somewhere around 180 to 190 with this rig, under mild temperatures, if I'm in like 110 degree weather somewhere in Las Vegas or in Southern California, well, then I would expect the temperature of the engine to be higher than that. But somewhere in that 180 to 190 range is what I've been seeing driving around my neighborhood and doing a short run on the freeway. So I would pick up on that fairly quickly and know there's some type of issue if my temperature is down below the normal operating temp, I'll know something is up. Again, a problem with the gauge, a problem with the wiring for the gauge, or the thermostat is sticking. What I will say is that I've been driving vehicles for 43 years. I'm gonna be 59 next month. I started driving when I was 16 and none of the vehicles that I've owned ever had a sticking thermostat. I've driven a Ford Bronco. I've driven an old 60s Volkswagen Bug. I've driven a Honda Accord, a Subaru Outback, and now all three Forerunners that I own and none of them have ever had a sticking thermostat. Can it happen? Of course it can happen, but I think it's probably more of a situation where people aren't taking care of their cooling system by renewing the coolant at regular intervals, and then maybe there's some corrosion that builds up in the system, and then the thermostat sticks. A thermostat is a fairly simple mechanical thing. There's not a whole lot that can go wrong with it, but again, I'm gonna acknowledge that it is a possibility that the thermostat can stick and I might not catch it right away. So that's the one concern with 
installing the temperature gauge in the upper radiator hose because it's not tapped into the engine, it's tapped in after the engine. So I fully understand the limitations of how I install the temperature gauge and I'm good with it. So I just wanted to share that with you so you can understand the limitations of the way I installed the temperature gauge. All right, I'm all done with this job. You just saw how I installed an aftermarket coolant temperature gauge on a first generation Toyota 4Runner. You obviously have lots of options with this mod. You have options in regards to which brand of aftermarket gauge you use. I chose a more affordable one. It's most likely made in China, but I'm okay with that. I've had good luck with my other affordable gauge that I bought from Max Toe for my 98 4Runner. It was a transmission temperature gauge install and that one has been working flawlessly for a few years now. And so I'm hoping I get the same longevity from this glow switch one. And if I don't, I'm not too worried about it. It was only like 50 bucks. And if it breaks, I'll just buy another one. Or maybe the company will warranty it if it's within the warranty period. Another area where you have options of how you do it is the wiring. How you tap into a 12 volt constant source, a 12 volt switch source, a illumination wire, grounding location, how you run the wires. It's gonna be up to you how you wanna do it. I tapped into wires all in the engine compartment for your application, if you're better than me and you know how to tear apart the dash better, you could access wires in the cab to power all the different functions for the gauge. And then finally, the last option is where you mount the gauge. My original plan was to mount it to the roll bar, but because that pod was delayed in getting to my house, I chose another one and it just glued on right to the top of the trim around the steering column. And it seems to work out fine and I might just keep it there. But again, I might decide to weld the tab onto the roll bar and mount that metal gauge I have coming right there. This rig just got back from a wheeling trip in the gold country near Gold Lake. The trail I went on was Snake Lake. I'd done it once in my 98 Forerunner and now I've done it in my first gen. It was way more fun with the first gen with the dual cases and on 37s, way more fun. Very soon, I'm gonna be taking this on a trip to the Rubicon, provided my buddies that are supposed to go with me don't bail on me because I don't wanna go in there by myself. That would be very, very stupid. You need to go in with at least one other rig so if you get into trouble, you can pull each other out or get towed out. So if that trip happens, be in the lookout for a video on that because I am planning on videoing that whole experience. We're gonna spend four days out there just taking our time on the trail and really enjoying it. So I hope you learned something from this video. If you are gonna be installing an aftermarket coolant temperature gauge on your first gen 4Runner, I hope it helps you with your install. Knowing the actual temperature you are at is very imperative with these vehicles the analog needle gauge, even if it was working properly for me, which it isn't, it's still a very, very bad way to monitor your coolant temp because with my experience, those analog needle gauges, once they start rising, the temperature in your engine has already spiked really high to a dangerous level to the point where you're cracking heads or you're blowing head gaskets, that sort of thing. So you want to be alerted much sooner than those OEM analog needle gauges will do for you. So I'm stoked I finally have one on this rig. On the last trip that I took, we were driving through 110 temperature through the Sacramento area, and I was pretty much clueless to where my temperature was, and that is, to put it mildly, unsettling to not know the temperature my engine's at. So feel better now and there it is there with all that said we thank you for watching toyota time with timmy the tool man and sean we will of course be back with more videos thank you for watching thank you for subscribing if you haven't subscribed yet click that subscribe button and also click on that notification bell if you'd like to be notified when we put up new content on our channel peace out happy ranching sick mods and sick coolant temperature gauge installs on your first generation toyota 4runner bye bye